Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of Space This Week, the Monday show in which we cover all the hottest rocket topics from spaceflight, starship, and other major events in the space industry. We've got a lot of stuff to cover, so let's jump right into it. Beginning once again, as always, with a look at all the latest developments with SpaceX's Starship that we saw over the last seven days. We've been getting hyped for the supposed second flight of Starship SN15, the first full-scale Starship prototype to complete a high-altitude flight test and not be destroyed by a massive explosion. However, after Elon Musk's initial tweet, we had basically radio silence, and as the days became weeks, it began to look less and less likely that we'd see the beast fly again. And last week, those unfortunate suspicions were confirmed as the SN15 was removed from the launch pad and rolled back to the production site. I doubt it'll be scrapped like SN5 and 6 were though, rather the current speculation is that it'll be some sort of monument, maybe to accompany the recently completed Starbase sign outside the facility, much like how SpaceX installed the first fully recovered Falcon 9 first stage outside their offices in Los Angeles. Me personally, I think it would be a great accompanying structure for the high bay bar. Turn the SN15 into a grain silo and start distilling Starship whiskey. Maybe call it Blast Off Bourbon, Elon Malt, Scotch Ship. Please, SpaceX, hit me up. I've got loads of these. I imagine the main reason that Starship SN15 second flight was taken off the cards was because SpaceX now really needs to get the infrastructure in place for its orbital flight test of the Starship and Super Heavy vehicle, and any rocket flights like the SN15 would have put a hold on all the groundwork that needs to take place. And a lot of groundwork needs to be done. The launch tower is quickly taking shape, and SpaceX are churning out ground support tanks, or GSE tanks, which will store things such as liquid oxygen, methane, grains? <laughs> All the things necessary to support and fuel a rocket launch, basically. So high up the priority list are these GSE tanks that they've started taking up residence in Brendan Lewis's overview diagrams of the production progress at Starbase. You'll also see on this diagram that BN3 is coming along very quickly. Elon has confirmed that it'll be sporting 29 Raptor engines for its first flight, though at some point SpaceX want to, somehow, squeeze in three more engines into this configuration. I say BN3, although in terms Finally, it may have been renamed back to BN2, or just Booster 2, according to Elon Musk's latest tweet of Starship SN16 and the so-called Booster 2. I'm sure we'll hear more as the booster comes together. <laughs> We've also heard from Elon that SpaceX are aiming for the first orbital Starship to use a pressure-fed hot gas thruster system for reaction control, using methane gas. Traditionally, cold gas is used for spacecraft orientation as it's much simpler and it's much more well-tested, and up until now, Starships have been using nitrogen cold gas thrusters, which are significantly less efficient but are much more favourable for the rapid prototyping SpaceX are undertaking as they're much more simple to implement. A hot gas system is substantially more mass efficient, but also much more complex. This will be, bar one or two exceptions, the first spacecraft to use non-hypergolic bipropellant thrusters for reaction control, and how exactly SpaceX plan to supply the thrusters with propellant remains unclear. Either they'll be pressure-fed, which will require high-pressure plumbing throughout the whole Starship, or they'll need to be a turbo pump for every single engine, which of course will add a fair amount of mass and further complexity. And then there's the issue of the thrusters possibly needing their own pre-burners, presumably, since the liquid methane fuel will need to be converted to gas. So much complexity and really beyond my amateur armchair scope, so I'll leave the technical discussions to those far more qualified, but long and short of it is that the hot gas thrusters are really great, but really complicated, but probably necessary in the long run. Traditional propellants are quite dangerous to handle and don't lend themselves well to the rapid production and reusability that SpaceX are striving for. It's exciting to see the orbital class of Starship vehicles unfold and watching the skyline of Boca Chica rapidly undergo change with the construction of the launch tower. I'm also curious about SN16, which has been silently teasing us from the high bay. I'd say it's unlikely it'll be flown at this point, but one can always hold out hope. Anyway, that's all the major Starship news I wanted to cover from last week, so let's move along to the next segment of the video, everything else that happened last week. Last week, we saw three orbital rocket launches. The first was on the 26th of May, and was quite possibly the most picturesque-looking Starlink launch that we've seen yet. 
at that beautiful blue sky. This was SpaceX's latest Starlink mission, Starlink L28, which once again involved a Falcon 9 rocket launching 60 Starlink satellites to orbit. The first stage landed successfully on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, bringing an end to the second flight of this particular first stage, and the fairings were recovered by the ship Go Searcher and also by Go Navigator. So hopefully both halves will fly again on another Starlink mission. This particular Starlink mission was quite a significant one, as this launch completed the first Starlink orbital shell, consisting of 1,584 satellites orbiting at an altitude of 550 kilometers. SpaceX planned to have five shells for phase one of Starlink. You can almost think of these shells as being like sub-constellations, each one being at a different altitude, inclination, and consisting of a different number of satellites, in order to maximize coverage of the network on Earth. With completion of Shell 1, which consists of 72 orbital planes with 22 satellites in each, about 80% of the Earth's surface is now covered. So now, you can like my videos from almost anywhere! Why not take the time to do so now? If you're finding the content presented here to be informative and hopefully enjoyable, as liking the videos really does help channels out, and while you're at it, do hit subscribe. As you can imagine, the rapidly evolving nature of space news means that these videos are best enjoyed on the first day of upload, so subscribing helps ensure that you're getting the most out of these videos. Anyway, let's continue with the news. Two days after Starlink, we had a competing satellite network launch its latest batch. That's right, this was the Soyuz 2.1 launch on the 28th of May, which carried the next 36 satellites for the OneWeb satellite constellation. The rocket launched from the Vostochny Cosmodrome, and the flight was operated jointly by Ariane Space and StarSem. So far, 218 OneWeb satellites have been launched. The initial constellation is planned to have 648 of them in low Earth orbit to provide a similar goal of Starlink and offer satellite internet on a global scale. OneWeb hope to begin offering internet services later this year as the network continues to grow. On the 29th of May, we saw a Long March 7 launch the Tianzhu 2 logistics cargo module to the newly established Chinese space station, which at present consists of just the core module, with grand expansion planned over the next few years. The first crewed mission to the station is expected to happen on the 17th of June, and since the station has more than one docking port, there's a reasonably good chance that the cargo module will remain attached for the crewed visit, but so far, no clear information has been disclosed. Time will tell. In addition, to the four orbital rocket launches we saw last week, we also saw two suborbital Terrier improved Malamut sounding rocket launches. These rockets just go straight up and straight down, no orbiting or anything, and the first was on the 24th of May, which launched from the Estrange Space Center in northern Sweden, carrying three material physics experiments on board. The other Terrier improved Malamut launch was on the 27th of May, and launched from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia, carrying the Viper experiment for the University of Berkeley, which is an iron ionospheric propagation experiment. And that's a wrap on all the major launch events that took place last week, so now let's get out our pens and get ready to mark our calendars for all the launches we're expecting to see this week. So far, there are three orbital launches expected for this week. The first will be on the 2nd of June and will be a Long March 3BE, which will launch from the Zichang Launch Complex in China, carrying a meteorology satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit on behalf of the China Meteorological Association. The next launch will be on the 3rd of June and will be a SpaceX Cargo Dragon resupply mission to the International Space Station, CRS-22. The rocket will, of course, be a Falcon 9, and the first stage will land about about 400 kilometers downrange on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, which will be the first ever landing for this brand new Falcon 9 booster. The cargo spacecraft will contain a number of things, such as science investigations, crew supplies, and spacewalk equipment, as well as the first pair of new rollout solar arrays. Rollout arrays are a relatively new technology and are lightweight and flexible solar panels designed to provide much more energy than traditional panels, while also coming in at a much lower mass, being flexible and rollable and operating in a similar fashion to how a measuring tape unwinds on its spool. The current designs are 20% lighter and four times smaller in volume than a rigid panel equivalent with the same performance. Also coming along for the ride on the CRS-22 launch will be 11 CubeSats, 10 from the United States and one from the United Kingdom. Nine of the satellites are for technology demonstration purposes and the remaining two are for Earth observation. On the 
6th of June, we'll see another Falcon 9 flight. This will launch a single satellite, an SXM-8, on behalf of Sirius XM, a satellite and online radio service provider based in the United States. The satellite will be placed into geosynchronous Earth orbit. That launch will take place on Sunday, which means it happens at the end of the week and is therefore the last launch I needed to talk about in this segment. That was a weird sentence, wasn't it? So let's move along to our final segment now, all the best historic anniversaries that are set to take place over the next seven days. The first anniversary I want to discuss today is the 2011 landing of Space Shuttle Endeavour on the 1st of June, which would be the shuttle's final ever touchdown after 25 flights. Today, it's currently housed in a temporary structure at the California Science Center, though plans for a permanent home for the shuttle involve having it attached to the last remaining mission-ready external fuel tank and two solid rocket boosters raised in a vertical position as if about to make one more launch. On the 2nd of June in 2003, a Soyuz rocket launched the ESA's Mars Express probe from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. As the name would suggest, this probe went to Mars and was the first ever interplanetary mission attempted by the ESA. The spacecraft consisted of two parts, the Mars Express orbiter and the Beagle 2 Mars lander. Unfortunately, the lander failed to fully deploy after landing on the Martian surface, but the orbiter worked well. It has been successfully performing scientific measurements since early 2004, and given that it's still operating today, and has been since arriving at Mars in 2003, the Mars Express is the second longest surviving and continually active spacecraft in orbit around another planet, trailing just behind NASA's 2001 Mars Odyssey orbiter. On the 3rd of June in 1965, Gemini 4 was was launched. This was quite a record-breaking flight for two reasons. Firstly, this would be the first ever multi-day space mission by a NASA crew, and secondly, astronaut Ed White performed the first ever American spacewalk, spending about 20 minutes outside of the capsule attached to a tether. During the mission, the first attempt to perform a space rendezvous was made, as James McDivitt attempted to maneuver the capsule towards the separated Titan II upper stage, but unfortunately wasn't successful, mostly due to the the fact that at the time, NASA engineers hadn't quite worked out the nuances of orbital mechanics involved with rendezvous, in that simply thrusting towards a target will change the spacecraft's velocity relative to the target vessels, resulting in increased separation of the two craft, rather than bringing them closer together. The Gemini capsule splashed down successfully after spending four days in space, and today is on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. On the 4th of June, we have the anniversary of two major rocket flights. The first is the 1996 first flight of the Ariane 5, which went really, really well for 37 seconds before it exploded. Luckily, 14 years later, in 2010, the maiden flight of SpaceX's Falcon 9 went much smoother, successfully placing a boilerplate version of the Dragon spacecraft into low Earth orbit. Both rockets remain in service to this day, and I think it's fair to say that they've both had pretty successful careers so far. The final anniversary of the week is on the 6th of June and is the 1971 launch of Soyuz 11. This was the first and only crewed mission to board the world's first ever space station, Salyut 1, and the crew spent 22 days on board. Tragically, the mission ended in disaster when the crew capsule depressurized during re-entry preparations, resulting in the death of all three crew members, Georgi Dobrolsky, Vladislav Volkov and Viktor Patsayev. The three cosmonauts are the first, and to date only, humans known to have died in space. The Soyuz spacecraft design subsequently underwent extensive redesigns to prevent a repetition of the events. Crew capacity was reduced to two, allowing extra room so that the crew could wear pressure suits for emergencies, an upgraded version of which is still in use today. The Soyuz spacecraft would end up going on to earn the legacy of being one of, if not the, most reliable rockets in the world, and is still in use today to transport crew to the International Space Station. Though it's worth noting the design has received incremental improvements over the years. The launch of Soyuz 11 was the final anniversary I wanted to discuss this week, which brings an end to this part of the video. <laughs> And that's it, another week is over. It definitely had its ups and downs, I think we were all a bit disappointed with the removal of SN15 from the launch pad despite being so hyped for a second flight, but SpaceX seemed to have all the data they could possibly gain from it, and so now they need to focus all their efforts into getting the necessary infrastructure for an orbital launch ready for the SN20 flight in July. Exciting times definitely lie ahead. Anyway, 
on screen is a list of names. They're my Patreon supporters. You can join their ranks by clicking the link in the description or the Patreon card on screen. You can also become a member of the channel by clicking the join button below the video and get a cool little badge next to your name as well as some exclusive emojis to write in the comments below. There's also two videos visible on screen as well. Uh, they're just from my channel that YouTube's algorithm thinks you'll like. Hopefully they're good picks. And that's everything. I do hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next Monday.